and I've been to a few of these summer schools over the years, um, not necessarily associated with this, but uh, one in Italy a few years ago, actually just before COVID and some others before that. And, and it's always just an enlightening experience to, to see all of you and to have the chance to kind of bridge that gap between kind of classical classroom learning and, and instruction versus research and where we are research-wise and things like that. And so I'm gonna try to do that um, today and tomorrow. My second lecture will be tomorrow. Um, and I think they're the first polymer chemistry lectures that you get, um, which is both great for me um, because I'm working with a blank slate, but also a little disadvantageous for you because the classical way might be to cover linear polymerization, some of the things that other people are gonna cover later in the week before networks. <coughs> Um, but instead, I'm going to talk about polymer networks, and then I'm going to introduce the concept of dynamic covalent chemistry, um, which I think is a very hot topic in chemistry in general right now, and then talk about the implementation of that in polymer networks. And that'll be kind of the, the outline, and I'll have some details on that here in a second for the two lectures that I'm going to give. All right, so cross-link networks. I, I love this picture, right? Um, so this, for those of us who are older, uh, they used to make cars out of plastics and thermosets, right? And so this is uh, the classic Trabant car uh, that was used to, or that was made from thermosets. Not necessarily the uh, best application of thermosets. Um, you could go all the way from there and transition this to kind of composite structural materials that Boeing makes uh, the Dreamliners out of now, and actually many of their airplanes. Uh, have significant components of that. You can talk about photolithography, you can talk about advanced biomaterials. Um, flat panel displays have almost an endless number of coatings that are almost all thermosets that are used to control the optical characteristics of those uh, flat panel displays. Um, your cell phone, whoops, uh, the cameras that you have in your cell phone are almost all triggered by very, very highly tuned lenses made from polymer optics, right? And uh, that can have the capacity to work in there. Uh, methacrylate dental restorative materials. And so almost all of you that have fillings in your mouth, right? Uh, those are almost all plastic in one form or another, a composite that's in there, but a thermoset, a cross-linked polymer structure that arises for that. Tissue engineering is an uh, application that has come into play uh, much more recently, but very, very important for all the different hydrogel applications that we can make from thermosets and that we might be able to use to do that, right? And so you can look in textbooks, very classic textbooks, and you can see, all right, what is it that characterizes a thermoset? And, and maybe characterizes is the wrong word, but what are the, some of the outcomes and attributes of a thermoset or a cross-linked polymer structure that we think of, right? And these are actually typically the reasons that we think of using these, right? So if I go back here, right? If you were flying on your 787 Dreamliner on the way over here, you probably didn't want that material to change shape very much on your way over here, right? Um, but at least those of us who had to fly across an ocean, that, that's a comforting thought, that this is a fixed, rigid structure. You know, it gets exposed to different conditions, different humidity in the atmosphere. It's not gonna change its swelling much. It's a high TG material mechanically resistant, it has great shape memory, it's gonna understand and, and behave appropriately for doing that, right? So that material can't be reformed, right? It's not like polyethylene. We can't go take our thermoset, our epoxyamine thermoset, and go recycle that and reprocess it and, and make it into a new shape, right? All of those crosslinks that are there, that essentially infinite molecular weight that that material has as a crosslink material, resists that. It doesn't want to be reformed. It can't be reformed. You can't just melt it like you can polyethylene, extrude it out through another, uh, you know, into another shape, right? <clears throat> can't be re-softened by heat. They're insoluble, right? So I can expose them to solvents. Whatever solvent I expose them to, if you have a fantastic thermodynamic solvent for that material, it's not going to dissolve it. It can swell it, but it can't dissolve it, right? And that makes these materials fundamentally different from kind of classic thermoplastics, linear polymers, branched polymers, et cetera, right? And so ultimately, that's a great set of applications. 
or implementations and properties, things like that, right? But it also has some pretty significant disadvantages, right? So what would you like to do with every plastic that you make right now? You'd like to recycle that, right? You'd like to reuse that material. You'd like to have that broken down and be able to take that and reprocess it and reutilize it, right? Boy, if I'm looking again, let's just think about this. What if I start to get cracks in this? <laughs> again, not sure I want to get on that plane, right? So how can I heal these materials? How can I adjust them to rework them, right? And so we can actually learn a lot from physical networks, right? And so physical networks are ones that are not covalently bound, right? Ones that have maybe hydrogen bonding or urethane interactions or pi pi stacking, right? A variety of other things that give rise to physical networks that have dynamic kind of pseudo crosslinks in them, right? And we can learn a lot from that because Many of these or implementations are kind of compromised by dynamic bonds. But boy, if you could figure out a way to turn those dynamic bonds on and off, you might be able to get the best of both worlds. And frankly, hopefully by the end of tomorrow's lecture, we'll show you that we can actually do that um, as a community and that we've made significant progress to saying, let's keep all the great properties of thermosets when we want to have those, but also start to move towards reprocessability reworkability, um, and re, uh, essentially re-engineering of those materials. And we'll do that through dynamic bonds, but we're going to do it through dynamic covalent chemistry. All right? Okay, so today's lecture, I'm going to talk about uh, basically where do we get networks from? How do we make polymer networks? What are the differences in different ways that we make polymer networks? And then introduce dynamic covalent chemistry, and we'll do this not so much in uh, polymers today, just an introduction of dynamic covalent chemistry, reversible addition, reversible exchange reactions in general. And I think I have about 10 or 12 different slides, and I'm glad to hear that you're going to get the slides, because frankly, I probably won't spend a lot of time on the details of each of those chemistries. Um, there are references to reviews, there are references to the papers that we see as some of the leading papers in those areas that people have done. So you'll see examples of all of these uh, dynamic covalent chemistries. And then tomorrow's lecture, I'll basically take this and I'll say, okay, let's put those in polymer networks and let's see what happens. Okay, so secondary polymer structure. Start from linear materials. I think Chris Matyshevsky and others will do a great job of talking to you about that as you go through the next couple weeks, including controlled polymerizations, living polymerizations, uh, et cetera. Kind of you move on to, to branched structures, right? So high density polyethylene to low density polyethylene, and ultimately to these cross link materials. So I'm going to, in the kind of tradition of a lecture, actually, um, something that's a school rather than me just standing up here talking, I'm going to ask you guys questions and I'm actually going to expect answers. Okay? I realize that that may be revolutionary. Um, <laughs> But it's going to happen, okay? Now, the good news is, if you were paying attention for the last five minutes, you can already tell me what the answer, whoops. <laughs> Dang. All right, to this question is, right? And if you're paying attention for now for the last 15 seconds, <laughs> as I manipulate my uh, pointer up here, you can even tell me better, right? What is it that makes a crosslink structure distinct, right? And so, since I already gave you this, right? So we're going to have mechanics that are different. We're going to have a plateau modulus in the rubbery regime. Right? Typically, what are those crosslinks going to do to the glass transition temperature? They're going to increase it, right? OK, I saw thumbs raising up, right? Because as I increase the number of crosslinks or the crosslink density, right? I decrease mobility, increase the glass transition temperature as a result. I'm going to reduce uh, or eliminate solubility of these materials, right? And I'm going to create a shape permanence in those materials. Basically, the structure in which those materials are formed, the shape in which they're formed, is what the crosslinks are going to remember and what that polymer wants to return to as its dynamic or as its equilibrium shape, right? That again makes it fundamentally different than any thermoplastic material. So if I have a linear or branched material, I can change what that equilibrium shape is. But when I have a cross-link structure, a network structure, 
The way that I polymerize that now becomes incredibly important because the shape in which I polymerize it is the shape that it will always remember and always tend to want to come back to at equilibrium. Okay. So how do we form cross-linked structures? Give me one example of a polymerization that forms a cross-linked structure. What? Epoxy. Epoxy amine, right? It, I don't know what you call it in France or the rest of Europe, but in the United States we have hardware stores, okay? And you go to the hardware store and you buy your epoxy, right? And you literally, right, you buy an epoxy. And basically that oftentimes is a two-component system. Sometimes you don't even see that it's two components because it comes out through an injector that will actually mix them for you, right? But it's an epoxy and an amine. Basically, the amine, each amine can react with two epoxies. The epoxy typically has at least two functional groups on it, right? So we're here. We're sitting at a, a functionality greater than two, okay? So that epoxy amine is an example of a step growth polymerization or a chain growth polymerization? Step. Step, right? And we'll talk about that, okay? And we'll talk about the differences and how they arise and lead to different structures in general. One of the classic ways of getting cross-linked structures, though, um, is actually post-polymerization cross-linking, right? And so this is actually <clears throat> done via a variety of ways. I'll review them just very quickly here in a minute. But the simplest way and the one you're probably most familiar with is just radiation, right? Take a, a linear polymer, and almost any linear polymer, in fact, depending on the radiation that you want to expose it to, you expose it to enough radiation, especially something like gamma radiation, you're going to cross-link that material, right? You're going to essentially create enough active centers on the backbone of that polymer material that they can recombine, oftentimes by termination of radicals or other different types of events, but they'll recombine, and ultimately what you'll end up with is a cross-link material from linear polymers, okay? We're actually not going to spend a lot of time on that today, okay? So in term, or today and tomorrow, because in terms of introducing dynamic covalent chemistry, this is probably the least common approach to doing so because you frankly have the least control over the structure, right? The, the chemistry that you're implementing in that system the, is essentially, you know, hitting something with a hammer, right? Um, and it's not very delicate. It's not very precise. Step growth polymerization, chain growth polymerizations, we need to think about a functionality greater than two, okay? Now, I'm going to be very precise in how I define functionality. So the functionality here is going to be the number of bonds that a monomer forms with other bonds. Okay, and, and we'll show you an example in a minute and give you a quiz question on that and see how you do with that. Okay, so post-polymerization cross-linking. As I said, gamma radiation, UV radiation, those are probably the most common. But what you will hear, and, and if I had actually seen their lectures yet, I, I'd know for sure, but I will venture a large guess that as you talk about controlled radical polymerizations and controlled polymerizations later in this week, you're going to see some other routes to forming cross-link structures that can also be done and actually provide us more of that control. And so two different types of, of doing that. One, right, is to say, all right, I'm going to co-polymerize with something that has essentially two orthogonal reactions. Let's say I take glycidyl acrylate. Like glycidyl acrylate is a molecule that has both an acrylate functional group and an epoxy functional group on it. If I homopolymerize the acrylate via radical polymerization, what happens to the epoxy? Absolutely nothing, right? I mean, essentially, right? So it sits there as a side chain. So people do this all the time. Copolymerize glycidyl acrylate with some other acrylate material. Now you have that epoxy as a side chain. And you can do all sorts of things with it. The more common thing to do with it is to functionalize it, maybe make it a hydroxyl, make it a, into some other capability and functionality you want. In the biological arena, people attach peptides through those molecules, through those side chains, et cetera. Well, we could use them easily, and people do, to just polymerize the, the epoxy, right? So I form this backbone acrylate material. Maybe 10% of the monomer units in there are glycidyl acrylate. So I put epoxies on about 10% of the repeat units. Now I expose that to a cationic system. Cations polymerize the epoxy and cross-link that material. Okay? Another way of doing it is to kind of add in an extra step. All right, so maybe for whatever reason you're concerned about the conditions under which that um, polymerization is formed and the epoxy is not going to be stable for whatever reason. Okay, we'll do it through two steps. 
Take something like hydroxyethyl methacrylate, right? This is commonly used in contact lenses. Copolymerize it with something like methyl methacrylate, okay? Now you have hydroxyls as the side chain. You can, again, functionalize those into something that's reactive, even into methacrylates again, et cetera. So three different ways, but all of them essentially being roughly equivalent in that we want to form the linear polymer, that backbone material, then attach functional groups to it, or create, in the case of radiation, functional groups that allow us to cross-link that structure. Again, probably the least common, definitely the least controlled, and the one we're going to implement the least in terms of dynamic covalent chemistry. So that'll, in fact, probably be the last time we hear about it. Now let's talk about something that's a diacrylate, okay? And not knowing all of your chemistry backgrounds, I did try to keep the chemistry as simple as possible to, to whatever the message is. So this is being a chemical engineer, my version of a diacrylate, okay? That could be an ethylene glycol unit, that could be an alkyl unit, it could be urethanes, it could be all sorts of things. But I have a diacrylate, okay? What's the functionality of that diacrylate? How many people say four? How many people say two? How many say something between two and four? <laughs> okay, so I, I have one of my students here who's had me in class. Ben, what is the right answer to almost any question like this I ask? It, it depends. <laughs> all right? So he's like embarrassed as I'll get out now. All right? So sorry about that, Ben. Um, right? How do you know what the functionality is until you know what the reaction is? Right? So for example, let's say I react that diacrylate in a thiomichael addition. Take it and I react it with a diethyl via a base catalyzed or nucleophile catalyzed reaction. The thiol reacts with the acrylate one to one. Right? In fact, if I did that and I reacted this diacrylate with a dithyl, would I get a network at all? No. I just get a linear polymer, right? Because the thiol would be difunctional, the acrylate would be difunctional. Each of them would form two bonds, and therefore I would just get that linear polymer alternating essentially between the thiols and the uh, acrylates. If I did the other one that some of you were thinking of, right? And I'll take that diacrylate and I'll just expose it to, say, a radical photo initiator. Really common implementation, probably many of the coatings on the wood in this room, right, are applied via this method where you have a multifunctional acrylate, take it, expose it to a radical, um, polymerize that. Now each one of those double bonds is going to classically open up, polymerize, it's going to form two bonds for each double bond that's there. And so those of you who said four, right, this is where you can get that very easily. That, of course, will be a very cross-link network. If I do something in between, right, so you'll find that there's another kind of radical mediated process. And if I introduce thiol, relatively high level of thiol compared to the acrylate, but now instead of doing a base or nucleophile catalyzed thiomichael, I do a radical reaction. Well, now each acrylate, it depends on how much thiol is there as to how many bonds it'll form, right? And it'll be between two and four. So the key here is that I have to know more about the system. I can't just look at a monomer and say, okay, I know what that's going to do. Because depending on the reaction that I'm doing, whether I'm doing step growth, whether I'm doing chain growth, whether I'm doing a catalytic reaction or an active center mediated polymerization, right? I'll get different structures out of that. And those structures are going to be what dictates ultimately what my characteristics of my network are. And eventually what we'll see is how that responds then to the implementation of dynamic covalent chemistry. Okay, so what happens is our average functionality increases, and this is actually incredibly important, right? Because one of the things that we want to manipulate, if we want to think about changing and, and using dynamic covalent chemistry to cause relaxation and reprocessability and things like that, is what can we do with that functionality to control our cross-linking density in our network structure? And so the, the simplest thing about this, right, is so this is some illustration of just the weight average molecular weight as a function of the average functional group conversion. So imagine that basically I was going to take this diacrylate in whatever mixture I was creating, and I was going to look at the weight average functional group, weight average molecular weight, excuse me, as a function of conversion of those acrylate functional groups, right? If I, was do, if I were doing 
this thiomicle reaction, right? As I said, all I'd get is a linear polymer. And I'd be subject to all of the problems of a linear step growth polymerization. And we'll talk about those in a minute, right? If I increase that functionality, so for example, I go to that diacrylate homopolymerization, I can actually get gel point conversions in acrylate homopolymerizations that are well below 5% or even 1% conversion, right? Because I might be able to polymerize 500 of those acrylates into a single backbone unit, right? And all I need if I have 500 of them is the weight average two of those pendant functional groups to react to give me a gelled system, right? So as I increase functionality, my weight average molecular weight diverges earlier. <clears throat> and so again, basically what I'm going to do here is change the gel point conversion uh, as I do this. And this will all change then, right? Cross-linking density changes with uh, functionality, glass transition temperature, as we already talked about, internal stress, all right? Which one of these two systems, all else being equal, do you think gives rise to a higher level of internal stress? The one that gels earlier or the one that gels later? And why? Earlier. earlier. Good. All right. So if it gels earlier, I form a, a macroscopic network, right? We already said once I form that macroscopic network, it can't relax, right? Well, that means that all this polymerization that happens out here, which almost every polymerization we're going to do and think of doing for forming networks is going to be one that leads to shrinkage. There are a few exceptions to that, but very few, right? So if all of a sudden I fix my network structure here and then I have all this polymerization that happens out here that causes additional densification, that's basically a strain I'm putting on that network, right? The network that was formed here essentially gets strained by all the shrinkage that happens out here. All the shrinkage that happens back here, what happens with it? Just flows, right? It's accommodated by flow. The system hasn't gelled yet. So assuming that I at least allow sufficient time for that process to occur, then my chemistry, basically right in this region, is all going to occur with very little stress developed in that system. Very little shrinkage. Well, the shrinkage will happen, but the shrinkage will be accommodated by flow of the material. So the later I make gelation, the lower all else being equal my internal stress is. All right. So step growth polymerizations, right? Simple reactions. Basically, the way we'll illustrate this is I have functional group A, functional group B. Capitals are unreacted. Um, uh, small letters are, are already reacted. So if I had an A2 plus B2 polymerization, I just get an AB linear polymer, right? And essentially, these are going to alternate. I'd have my whatever my repeat unit was between my A2, then I'd have my repeat unit between my B2, and again, A2, B2, A2, B2, and so on and so forth, okay? Why do we not have commercial polymers that are made that way? Slow. What? It's slow. I, it's really slow in general, okay? Although I can talk to you about one example where that's not the case. Yeah? Yeah, so, so again, when we homopolymerize an acrylate or a styrene or things like that, or polyethylene, right? We get hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of repeat units, right? In this polymerization, there are all sorts of reasons we can't get to high degrees of polymerization, right? So your classic theory of step growth polymerization, hey, I'm going to get very limited molecular weight because, right, I need high conversion. And I just put one kind of bullet point here, right? If I need 100 repeat units at a minimum to act like a polymer, if I have all the other things perfect that I'm about to talk about, I still have to get to 99% conversion. The reaction is generally slow. And at 99% conversion, it's oftentimes going 10 to the fourth slower than it did at the start because I've consumed 99% of the two functional groups that are reacting in that case, right? So if I have a, essentially a second order reaction, yeah, I'm at 10 to the fourth times slower rate than I was at the start, okay? All sorts of problems with that. And that's before we even talk about the fact that, you know, you, you better make sure you weigh out those compounds really well because if you're off by 2% and how much one compound you add versus the other, well, now you're at 50%, 50 repeat units, even if you get to 100% conversion, right? 
Or, gosh, you bought things off the shelf, and again, I don't know who your suppliers are here, but Aldrich in the US, they might send me one batch that's 98%, they might send me one batch that's 99% purity. That doesn't work for a linear step growth system, right? Because all of a sudden, that 98% purity, if I thought it was 100% weighted out accordingly, again, I'm stuck with a maximum of 50 repeat units. Okay? Good news is, all of those problems go away when we actually gel the system. Okay? They're dramatically diminished. So when we do step growth polymerizations, right? I have one system where we do linear polymerizations with step growth systems. And, and every time pretty much I talk about it, I have to swear that my grad students are so much smarter than I ever have been because I told them it wouldn't work for all those reasons that I just showed you, okay? Um, so if anybody wants to have fun conversations over the rest of the week, that, that's one I, I'm happy to have. Um, the good news is though, when I go to multifunctional systems, these problems go away, right? So if I'm 5% off on the stoichiometry on, say, an A3, B4 polymerization, my cross-linking density changes by a few percent, right? My gel point conversion changes by a few percent. But if I'm going to get to 95% conversion, I'm going to have pretty much the same polymer that I would have had had I even had the stoichiometry right, okay? It's going to be a little different. The cross-linking densities are going to be a little different, et cetera but I'm not going to go from 50 repeat units to 500 repeat units or 10 repeat units to 100 repeat units, like I'm going to and completely change the characteristics of my material. So that's why you see an epoxy amine hardener. You don't see an epoxy amine linear polymer, right? Okay, so with this, we can control gelation. That's fantastic, right? We just said that stress is controlled by when we gel the system and how we gel the system. Well, now we can use that functionality, right? So gosh, I illustrate this as if maybe this is an A3B4 polymerization. But what if I want the gel point conversion to be a little bit higher? Well, that's easy. Just introduce some A2. Decide how much A2 you need. Maybe you need 10% A2 to control that. And you need a, a diol, right? A little bit of diol thrown into a triol and that'll change your average functionality to 2.8 and it shifts your gel point conversion to where you need it to be. Or it shifts your cross-linking density to where you need it to be, right? So it's all of a sudden very, very easy because of what we know about and what we can control with stoichiometry to control gelation. We can intentionally leave residual functional out groups, right? We're gonna talk a lot about click chemistry here in the next few minutes, right? Boy, click chemistry. I may want residual alkynes so that I can take that polymer network that I form and I can do some additional functionalization on it. Maybe I can even photo-induce functionalization on it so that I can pattern where that happens. Well, that's easy. If this is an alkyne azide polymerization, just introduce 5% excess alkyne. Polymerization goes to completion. Guess what's everywhere throughout your network? 5% of those alkynes. And that works with any step growth polymerization, right? I can use stoichiometry. I can use mixtures of monomers in ways that I can't with um, chain growth polymerizations. And I have much better level of control uh, over that, whether it's via functionality, stoichiometry, or stopping it at a, at a known or given conversion, all right? <clears throat> and I went over some of this already, right? You know, what reactions work? Frankly, pretty much any reaction, right? Go to your favorite organic chemistry reaction. Odds are you could make monomers that would make that work and have a polymerization that would form a network out of it, right? If you want to go with an acid chloride and an alcohol or an acid chloride and an amine, or you wanted to react um, some classic etherification reaction, right? If you create monomers that have more than two functional groups, Right? On average, for each of those, react them relatively stoichiometrically, right? And if you react them under conditions you can get to relatively high conversions, guess what? You're going to form a network, 
right? So pretty much any reaction you want to think about. But then, okay, that gets a little more complicated. You got to think, okay, so now I picked my curing reaction. I got to figure out a way to get the right number of functional groups on those monomers. Got to figure out what my initiating system is going to be, right? Okay, so the, there are complexities. The principle is you can probably make that work to form a network. The desirable characteristics, though, right? Okay, somebody already mentioned, I want my reactions to go fast, right? Maybe, usually I do, but not always, right? And how fast is fast? That epoxy you mean hardener? One of the things that you can buy, right, is different time sets for that. You can buy one that sets in 20 minutes, or you can often buy one that sets in 24 hours. That's because you may need different work times and working capacity for that. The same thing goes in commercial processes, right? That when we're doing something, I mean, we were uh, on a contract with Boeing, um, working on some of those things for 787s and some adhesives and things like that, right? One of the crazy things that they have to do is literally, okay, we know we need an adhesive in here, but the person who's gonna mix that up is gonna mix it up out, you know, essentially outside the plane. Then they have to crawl inside the wing and figure out where they're gonna put that adhesive, put it in there, and get it to work, right? Well, that means you probably don't want that adhesive setting up in the first, say, 20 minutes after you mix it, right? Um, or you're gonna waste all of that, right? Other things, you know, if I'm curing coatings on an optical fiber, I got fractions of a second to cure those, right? So speed is important, but not always fast, right? So desired and controlled speed. You'd love for it to go at ambient temperature in a lot of cases, right? But again, not necessary. There are plenty of those reactions where we'll heat up those systems to cause them to, to react and, in fact, use temperature as the trigger for this. In our case, we love it when we can trigger reactions in general. So whether that's with temperature, whether that's with light, whether it's actually in biological systems with exposure to some... Uh, type of biological stimulus, whether that's a peptide, a protein, uh, enzyme, et cetera. Um, one of the things, and, and this, you know, again, is not necessary, but strongly desirable in most circumstances, is we want to get rid of small molecules, right? If I react an alcohol and an acid and form an ester as my polymerization reaction to form the network, I'm going to have water everywhere throughout that network, right? And if I've just made a highly cross-linked network with a bunch of water in it, that impurity is going to last a long time. It's going to be hard to get out. It's going to be difficult to work with, et cetera. So usually when you think about probably actually, frankly, the, the main limitation on kind of those classical organic small molecule reactions is that you're going to form a product, right, a condensation product, water, an amine, something like that that's a small molecule product, <clears throat> again, can work, but is oftentimes disadvantageous. You want uh, high conversions. So whatever reactions you're doing, you want to have favored uh, up to high conversion. Really not have preferably any equilibrium limitations on that. Okay. Okay. So what does that sound like? What? Click. Right. Somebody said it. Right. There's a reason that all those things. Right. If you go through Sharpless's definition of, of click chemistry, right? Boy, that sounds a lot like it, right? High yield, single product. I mean, one of the things I didn't put down there, but it's very much true, right? We have all those other functional groups on our monomers that we don't want to have react during the polymerization, right? So we want to have chemistry that's what we call orthogonal. And all that means, for those of you not familiar with it, is that we want a reaction that consumes and reacts the functional groups that we want to react, but leaves all the other functional groups alone so that we can either have them in our final polymer or do something with them before we get to our final polymer as a result of that, right? Um, we want it to happen under mild and ambient, again, this is Sharpless's uh, descriptions, mild or ambient conditions. So, gosh, we want to be able to do this in the presence of air. We want to do it in the presence of water if we can. Ambient temperature is fantastic when we can make all of that work, right? Um, facile separation or product isolation, this is basically kind of going back to don't form small molecules as a result of this reaction because they're going to be really hard to remove from a polymer network, right? 
And then this last one actually, if, if for those of you who have read about click chemistry, was actually one of the driving forces originally for this is, okay, we should have things that are easy, right? That you can really make fairly readily and that you can actually use. And so this limits our chemistry as well, all right? And so the idea here overall is that, hey, we want to have simple, readily available starting materials, very highly efficient reactions, and in our case, these target properties are going to be associated with the polymer network. What are the characteristics of the polymer network that we're going to have when we're done with that polymerization reaction? Okay, so I put together a few different examples of these. Um, they will get the slides, right? Yes. Yep. So you're going to get all of these. I won't go through them. We'll have some of this in more detail as I go through uh, some of the details. But suffice to say that we have azide alkyne reactions and several different thiol reactions that are all kind of classic click reactions. So let's look at a few of those. So first of all, and probably the original one of these that at least has been more used than almost anything else historically is the radical mediated thiolene reaction. Okay. This has actually been around for almost 100 years if you go back into the literature, um, although not necessarily always called that. Uh, Charlie Hoyle and several other people, John Woods, uh, Henkel, really brought this back about 25 to 30 years ago uh, into prominence, and you now see it um, all over the place. And I think it, it coupled beautifully with Sharpless's concept of click, of click reactions and then especially implementing this in, in polymer networks. And so the idea here is that we have a thiol and an ene, and ultimately the product of those uh, ends up being this thioether. It's radical mediated, so it's trivial to initiate with light. It's the most common way of doing it. Um, you can initiate it thermally. You can initiate it with redox uh, reactions as well. And essentially, once you generate those radicals, you get an alternating process between chain transfer and propagation. So if we enter kind of this cycle at some point, assuming that we have this carbon-centered radical, we get a chain transfer reaction that abstracts the hydrogen from the uh, from the thiol. It essentially caps this thiol radical or this carbon-centered radical, reforms a thiol radical. That thiol radical undergoes propagation with the carbon-carbon uh, double bond. That's what gives us the thioether in the first place. And so, when we undergo the chain transfer, it does this, forms the thioether. The great thing about it is each radical that's formed causes hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands of essentially cyclic processes. So propagation and chain transfer processes. Because the problem with most of these reactions like this, right, is that they would be slow. But when it's radical mediated, it's not slow here. Because this propagation and chain transfer steps alternating are incredibly rapid. And we've had uh, thiolene polymerizations, as have many others, that are well uh, or completely done within one to five seconds um, relatively readily. And then you look at the characteristics of this, right? If you pick the right vinyl, say a, a vinyl ether or a norbornene functional group, you don't get any homopolymerization. So the functionality of this E becomes exactly one, okay? The functionality of this thiol becomes exactly one. You can perform it at ambient temperature. It's very rapid. Um, there's really low uh, inhibition with oxygen, et cetera. Um, you get great optical material properties out of this. So one of the things that thermosets have actually entered ever more prominently into in terms of applications is optics applications. Just one second, I'll get right to you. Um, and that's because of the presence of these uh, sulfur atoms. Yeah, what was your question? Um, so what is the no homopolymerization? Yep. No, so it's the type of ene that you polymerize. And so vinyl ethers and norbornene will give you, to the ability to measure it, pure alternating propagation, etc. If I instead made this ene an acrylate, right, then I'd have a competition because this radical can react with that ene or it can abstract a hydrogen here, right? And so once you pick your double bond, it doesn't actually matter whether it's monovinyl or divinyl or trivinyl, right? It matters what the, the character, the chemistry and the character of that double bond is. The acrylates are the worst from having homopolymerization. So 
So they'll bite back about as frequently if you have equal concentrations of ene and thiol. They'll attack the ene again almost as readily as they'll attack the thiol. The saccharides are a little better at chain transfer. Allyl ethers, we oftentimes think of them as being ideal thiamine systems, but they will even bite back and attack the allyl ether about 10% of the time at equal traits when they get rid of concentration. Um, so it's not so much the number of enes that you have, but the character, the chemical character. And it's whether this radical will react with that ene that you have to consider. Um, so it's affected on the concentration or in the company? No, the binyl ether in the norboinian are essentially zero. The allyl ethers would be about 10%. Um, vinyl silanes are actually quite good as well. They're closer to 0%. Um, acrylates, again, are about 50-50. So you really want not very reactive double bonds. Uh, it's not that it, it has to be not very reactive to this uh, radical center, right? Uh -huh. And so vinyl ethers and norbornes, right, are incredibly reactive double bonds. In fact, the, I mean, if I put a vinyl ether in with a thiol, through this mechanism, I can't even stabilize it. I can't keep it around for days because once that mixture's there, it's so That's reactive. That's the right way. It's more right. that they should not be reactive with the Exactly. It's, it turns out that, of course, those are reactive with the thiol radical and not the carbon-centered radical. In the case of the um, vinyl ether, it's that basically the carbon-centered radical and the carbon-centered double bond are both electronegative, right? And so they essentially have charge-charge repulsion that keeps them from reacting. Um, so not all radicals are created equal. No, definitely not. Yep. All right, any other questions? Yeah, please. Um, I, was, I have a question. Like, how do you think it is? Like, just the actual macroscopic You don't know what I mean by what? Shrinkage. Okay. Like the actual macroscopic volume is shrinking. And is that caused by, like, the protein conformation shrinking? Or what is causing that shrinkage? Yeah, so... Um, I suppose I have to keep this since we're being recorded. So one of the best examples is when they go into your mouth and they fill a cavity in your mouth, because that, that's, that's one you're probably familiar with, or hopefully you're not familiar with, but you're friends, right? Um, so you go into the dentist, and she drills out whatever she wants to fill, and she packs that in there, right? Well, she's packing in a mixture that's maybe 50% by mass monomer and 50% by mass filler. As the monomer goes to polymer, the polymer is more dense than the monomer. And, and it is essentially, right, van der Waals, right, forces are, are largely what's responsible for this, right? That the monomer essentially has, you know, less interaction with what's around it, forces it to a, a greater distance. Once you form covalent bonds with those other monomers, basically pulls them closer than they would have been otherwise. So yes, when you, when you go in, the dentist literally can measure, you know, if they do too thick a filling and things like that, they can measure the cusps of your teeth being pulled together by the stress that's generated in that filling from the shrinkage that happens. Um, the other places you see this are warping, right? So that, those flat panel TVs, they have to be incredibly careful about how they put those coatings on and how they cure them because as you cure them, you generate stresses and those stresses cause warping. Same thing happens in additive manufacturing. Right? Additive manufacturing, you're doing these layer by layer processes. Each layer shrinks a little bit. And if you try to make a really big part be additive manufacturing, the biggest concern you have is that warping that will occur uh, during it. But it's all driven by the fact that the polymer is more dense than the monomer you start with. Yeah, actually, I had a question down here first. One of you two, right? Well, it's used to form the it, it, to form the polymer too. So, you know, uh, somewhere along here, I'll actually, yeah, right. So, if we have this tetrafunctional thiol and difunctional ene, both of those are going to be small or can be low molecular weight materials. So, it's the polymerization and crosslinking are happening simultaneously with each other. So, I'm forming essentially this idealized network structure at that point. Yep. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so, so ring opening polymerizations of the right types of rings systems will actually expand. So epoxies will shrink a lot less than acrylates or methacrylates because you're doing a ring opening reaction. 
Um, and so when you ring open, right, if you think about, oh, I'm pulling two molecules closer together, well, that ring is denser than the others. So, so an epoxy polymerization might only have a couple percent shrinkage. If you do a methyl methacrylate bulk polymerization, it shrinks almost 20%, okay? Um, and then, so the ones that don't shrink at all and actually expand, there's some spiroorthocarbonates structures, and usually those are actually multi-ring fused structures where once you add a radical into them, both of those rings open up, and the fact that you're opening up two rings counters the shrinkage that you get from bringing more molecules together almost completely, or in some cases completely. Problem is you don't get very good properties mechanically from them, so even though you get no shrinkage, they're very little used because of essentially the mechanics are, are not as good as you'd like. Great questions. Anybody else? All right, and if for some reason I don't see a hand up, you know, by all means, just yell at me. I have a question. Yeah. Are we talking about radicals here? So this is, this is the thiolene system. So the way that we would initiate this polymerization is by generating radicals. Uh, this is not supposed to be chemistry showing. This is not pushing electrons. Okay. Nope, this is that this thiol will add into that double bond and give the thioether. Yep, nope. Anybody else? All right, so we were talking about shrinkage, right? So let's look at this. We talked about how gel point conversions are going to be important, right? So this is your classical filling that's actually put in your teeth. Um, the resin phase of that, it's bisphenol A dimethacrylate and triethylene glycol dimethacrylate. Probably constitutes about 70% of dental resins, something like that, in terms of the monomers that are used for that. If we compare that to a thiolene system, so this is a classic dimethacrylate, homopolymerization, radical polymerization, gel point conversion is very, very early in that polymerization. In contrast to a 3-4 thiolene system that now will have a significantly delayed gel point conversion. They have very similar glass transition temperatures um, associated with that. And you can see the difference in the stress level that builds up between these two. And this is because of the delayed gelation that happens here in that thiolene system. So when we use that step growth polymerization, it does exactly what I showed you on that plot from some time ago, that basically if we use that, it delays gelation and uses that delay in gelation to limit the stress that arises in these polymerizations. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. Okay, so let's go on and talk about another thiol reaction that's a click reaction, but one that's not now radical mediated. So the thiolene reaction is radical mediated. You generate radicals again via photo initiators, thermal initiators, a variety of things like that. Um, in contrast, the thiol Michael addition reactions are either base or nucleophile catalyzed, right? And they're actually, in many respects, easier to have be ideal in terms of kind of getting a one to one step growth addition. The great thing about the thiol Michael reaction is that there's the number of substrates that you can use is much higher than you can and get uh, ideal outcomes from it than you can in the, the radical mediated thiolene reaction. And so, Here's just an illustration. So you can react a thiol with a malleimid, with a vinyl sulfone, with an acrylate, with an acrylamide, acrylonitrile, methacrylate's even under the right conditions, right? All of those, when base or nucleophile catalyzed, will essentially behave ideally in terms of a one-to-one -one addition from my essentially reactive functional groups A and B going to a single product, all right? That allows us to have that very idealized um, character to the, the polymer network that we form. And the great thing about this in terms of um, kind of availability is that whereas, all right, you know, the, the number of divinyl ethers you can buy or multivinyl or multi norborning compounds you can buy is relatively small, right? But if you want to go buy a malleimid, there are hundreds and hundreds of malleimids you can buy. Commercially, acrylates, right? They're used in all those radical polymerizations. You can buy all of those same acrylates, and you can use them in thiomichael reactions uh, where it's either base or nucleophile catalyzed. So very, very simple drop-ins. Really tends to meet very nicely that capacity for availability of substrates. 
You know, that, that was one of the categories that we put in that click character was having that wide availability of substrates to us. And this, this reaction in particular meets that very, very easily. All right. Um, one of the nice things about it is that uh, as Charlie Hoyle developed and, and showed many, many years ago, now on the order of 15 years ago, um, if you do the right catalysts with these systems, they're literally too fast to be tracked. And in fact, um, some of the phosphine catalysts that Charlie Hoyle used to do these reactions, he found essentially he couldn't mix afterwards. He would have to mix into one of the two monomers because adding it into the mixture of the two monomers was almost explosive, right, because the reactions were so fast. Very readily controlled by limiting the reactivity of that nucleophile or limiting the reactivity of the base, but very, very feasible to control the speed all the way at ambient conditions from being well less than a second to being many hours uh, and even induction times possible uh, as a result of that. So when we think about thiolene, though, and, and this is actually a classic problem we need to think about generally with step growth, right? If I'm going to polymerize that diacrylate structure that we showed, if I polymerize it via thiomichal reaction v versus polymerizing it via radical homopolymerization, which one gives me a higher cross-linking density? Which one had the higher functionality? The, the radical homopolymerization, right? So one of the classic problems with step growth polymerizations in our networks is getting to sufficiently high cross-linking densities, right? Because when we took that diacrylate and we homopolymerized it radically, its functionality was four, right? And you can calculate cross-linking densities from molecular weights and functionalities, right? When I did it via thiomichal reaction, like I would have just shown on the previous slide, its functionality would only be two. So the cross-linking density generally in step growth polymerizations is lower, okay? So when we look at all those things that we liked about that, the uh, thiolene systems and thiomichal systems, there are a lot to like. They're oxygen resistant, they go rapidly at ambient temperature, they go to very, very high conversions, they delay gelation, they give a very homogeneous polymer network, all those wonderful things that, that I can get out of that, but I also get this low cross-linking density in modulus, right? And so this is an, actually an intrinsic limitation because of the functional group density. So what do you think about changing this, right? We can actually change this by replacing that ene with an ein, and if we replace the ene with the ein, then we're back to being able to get two reactions from each thiol, instead, or each essentially unsaturated group in this case, right, instead of one. And so quickly just showing what that does, right, basically instead of having just a single cycle like we had with the thiolene, when we react the ein, what we form is the ene. This is in this case called a vinyl sulfide. So now the ein reacts, reacts to give us the thioether, but also in this case that vinyl group that's still there. Turns out, um, and this is actually quite beneficial, most of the vinyls we form here, these vinyl sulfides, are actually more reactive than the eins we form or had originally. So once you form this vinyl sulfide, it undergoes a classic thiolene reaction, and it typically undergoes that more rapidly than the ion polymerizes itself in that first step. So the great thing about this, now let's compare. Basically, the only difference here is that I take this vinyl ether and replace it with a molecular or a nearly equivalent molecular weight of diine, okay? Polymerized with the same multifunctional thiols, and this is looking at the modulus behavior, and this is looking at the tan delta behavior. And what you see is that the modulus is an order of magnitude higher. So because we take that ein, and now each of these eins reacts with two thiols, each of these vinyl ethers reacts with one thiol, so the functionality here is four, the functionality here is two, you increase the, the um, modulus, therefore decrease the molecular weight between crosslinks, increase crosslink density, and you have this dramatic shift in the glass transition temperature. So this is one of the ways, just one second, thanks a lot. This is one of the ways to address that classic limitation, is to figure out ways of getting essentially more functionality in the same molecular weight of monomer so that when they react, they'll actually form that crosslink structure. Yeah. 
Yeah, so great point, and I don't think it's on this slide. So this will, right, um, because you've increased the functionality here, you're going to decrease the gel point conversion. You do increase the shrinkage because now you have more reactions for the same molecular weight. Um, let's see if I can pull numbers. The approximate numbers. Um, so classic methacrylate polymerization is about 22 uh, milliliters per mole of acrylates that react that will shrink. Okay, um, So we get about 22 you know, milliliters of reduction in volume per mole of acrylates that react. The vinyl ethers are roughly half of that. I want to say they're 12 or 13. And the ions are somewhere right in the middle of the two of them. Yeah, please. Um, I don't know that anybody has tried that. I think the acrylamides, though, I would be surprised if they didn't have some tendency for homopolymerization. Yes. Right. Also with the oxygen inhibition, I was kind of wondering if you've tried the triple bond, that it's not as prominent as the double bond. As I thought it was. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look at the structures and, and to see whether anybody's done it or tried it and see what would happen. The, the short of it is I don't know. Question. Oh, yeah, so why have you chosen these two molecules to compare with this example? Is one have an oxygen in it and one has a carbon detector? Yeah, so the oxygen only makes the ene more reactive, right? So the goal here, if you put a carbon, a carbon here instead of the oxygen, this polymerization is incredibly slow, right? And so because of that, you, you wouldn't reach the same conversions, you wouldn't have actually a great comparison. The comparison here was essentially using molecules with the same number of functional groups, two, and very close to the same molecular weights. In this case, they differ by less than 5%. So that you would get the same molecular weight between crosslinks if the two of them reacted the same. Okay, thank you. Yep. Others, yeah, please, in the back. So example, now, you, if you had a multifunctional dye, of course, would you use that instead of using these chemicals that are? So in our lab, and in a variety of others, we continue to try to make multifunctional thiols that have as high a density of thiols per molecular weight as you can get to try to also help with this, right? Because of the chemistry of the thiol, though, you're restricted. You, you can't just make, you know, a, an octafunctional thiol and have it only have a molecular weight of a few hundred, right? Um, believe me. <laughs> it, you can make polysulfur compounds, right? But having actual thiols on there and having a stable molecule formed as a result of it. So there's only, so, so yes is the answer, but there's a fundamental limit to how many thiols you can have or the equivalent weight per thiol in a highly functional thiol. So what you'd like to do is combine the two of them, right? So you want to end up reacting something that's a multifunctional line with a multifunctional thiol if you want to get the highest glass transition temperatures and the highest cross-linking densities you, you can get. So you want to do both. They see somebody else's hand back there? Oh, OK. All right. So then kind of the, let's see, I have 15 minutes left, huh? Hmm, OK. All right, well, we're going to move some of this to tomorrow. Uh, so the classic click reaction, right? So is this just out of curiosity? We'll see how many of you know your literature really well. So Sharpless and Melda, or Sharpless wrote the, the click chemistry paper, right? Was this the reaction he was referring to when he wrote the paper? Turns out this came out the year after he wrote that paper, right? Um, so uh, this is not the reaction that was in the paper, even though it is now the classic click reaction, right? So the Angevanta review that covered and introduced the concept of click chemistry, the name of click chemistry, et cetera, right, actually came out a year before, and it was essentially simultaneously Sharpless and Meldau's groups uh, developed this copper catalyzed azide alkyne reaction, right? And the key here being you react an alkyne and an azide and you form this triazole ring structure. 
It's about seven orders of magnitude faster if you catalyze it with copper one than it is if you catalyze it with copper two, right? And so phenomenal selectivity to the copper salt that's used to do that. And it essentially meets all of the requirements that we talked about for click chemistry. And that's why it is, if, you know, if you're gonna capitalize click, click reaction, this is the one that you're probably gonna capitalize. This is the most prominent one. And it has been used to make networks. <clears throat> It's been used to photo initiate these systems. I won't go through this, but if you want to generate copper one, you can do that with photo initiator and copper two. So the photo initiator generates radicals. The radicals reduce the copper two to copper one, which now catalyzes the reaction. For thermosetting systems and for step growth polymerizations, being able to not have a reaction happen or spontaneously is actually extremely advantageous. So the ability to trigger this reaction with light is actually something that adds significantly to its capabilities to use in um, thermosets and cross-link systems. The other interesting thing about this is that now, right, the triazole arises only during the polymerization, right? So what do we have in the monomers before polymerization? We have azides and we have alkynes in terms of the functional groups. In the polymer, we have triazoles. So why would we want triazoles? Well, we just said, classic problem with a step growth polymer network is that sometimes I get low TGs, low cross-linking densities. This is my triazole structure. What are the characteristics of it going to be? Pi-pi interactions, it's stiff, right? So all of a sudden, I'm getting only when I'm done the polymerization I'm getting lots of those secondary interactions that I probably want to increase toughness in my network and to increase the modulus and TG in my networks, right? And so ultimately, this gives us the advantage that we have the step growth polymerization, right? But we're starting to build in some of the capabilities that we get from a chain growth polymerization, especially in terms of high TGs. And this is just an illustration of that. And it's one of the great things that you can do with step growth polymerizations generally, is that you can do a lot of chemi chemical controls, right? Because you can make almost identical monomers. And so in this instance, we have a triene and a dithiol have almost exactly the same triene and diazide, okay? So almost the same molecular weights, therefore almost the same molecular weights between crosslinks uh, when the poly polymers are formed. And really what you're doing then is in the polymer structure itself, you're swapping out a thioether for a, a triazole, okay? And so here, right in the polymer structure from the thiolene, we're gonna have this thioether. In the, in the azide alkyne, the classic click, we're gonna have these triazole structures, okay? Everything else about the polymer, almost everything else about the polymer, the rest of the structure, right? This core, this core, they're basically the same, same molecular weight, same chemistry, so that all you're looking at is the difference between the triazoles and the thioethers. So that's what you see over here, right? So the TG shifts by almost 50 degrees. You replace the ene with the, the, or with the thioether with the triazole, you increase TG by about 50 degrees, okay? And that's actually compl uh, compar uh, comparable, this is my 2.30 a.m. Uh, mode, right, to what you get with carbamates. So if you can do the same structural kind of comparison with carbamates versus esters, you get actually something very, very similar. Dramatic increase in glass transition temperature uh, as a result of that. So some of the fun things that you see from these structures because of the secondary interactions, and I won't go into this in, in a lot of detail, but suffice to say that you make incredibly tough polymers. The presence of those triazoles allows for pi-pi stacking, lots of secondary interactions. And so now you take glasses made of these materials. And so, right, the TGs of these materials are all well above 50 and upwards uh, of 80. You test them at ambient temperature. And what you find is that your extensibility ranges from 50 to 125%. So literally, you're taking this glassy material, deforming it, and you can deform it up to 125%. And we now actually have materials that'll go well over four or five hundred percent in extensibility uh, made from these kinds of materials. 
So you can see it here. If you only deform this material 100%, then you heat it up. You actually recover its shape back, and you can continue to do that cycle over and over again. The deformation all occurs in the glassy state. Okay? So if you think that's characteristic of the testing methods, so if you make a methacrylate, so this is a dimethacrylate material, similar glass transition temperature to the polymer that it contains the triazoles, you can only deform that about 4.5% instead of the 100 plus percent that you can the triazole. If you make this from a thiolene system, again, very similar 4-3 system to what you have here um, in the triazole, you find that uh, it only deforms about 3%. Um, make a rubbery material out of this, you only get 4.5%. So it's the presence of the triazoles that give rise to this very, very tough character uh, in these networks. Um, you can even see that so in a shape memory experiment. So this is a foam that was created. You then take the foam, and at ambient temperature, you crush the foam. Right? So you take this, it has 80% porosity. You take it from its original volume and you reduce it by a factor of five. So you basically compress it nominally to eliminate all of the porosity in that material, and then you heat it up. Okay? And so the video is, a, is of this being heated. Right? And what you'll see is it'll come back to this native structure. It has its shape memory, and even in that glassy state, with all that porosity, you crush it down and you essentially don't fracture the material. So you can repeat that process, not all the way to 20% compression or 20% of its original volume, but if you were to only compress that to 30 or 40%, you can repeat this multiple times without uh, destroying the material. We tried that with an epoxy foam. The epoxy foam just breaks the very, very first time you do it, right? It's brittle. In this case, this is not only glassy, but it's still tough. All right, so chain growth polymerizations, and that's probably where I'll end. We'll introduce dynamic covalent chemistry next time, uh, and then its implementation in networks uh, as well. So now chain growth polymerizations, monovinyl monomer, right? So styrene, methyl methacrylate, ethylene, right? When we polymerize those, of course, we make a linear polymer. And there are all sorts of catalysts that can be used for this. We can even polymerize monoepoxies, right, cationically. And you can polymerize those and form a linear polymer out of them, right? Um, when we have the multivinyl monomer now, whether it's radicals, cations, anions, or metals, right, that's what's going to give us this cross-link network. And in this case, the chain growth nature, as I said, gives rise to gel point conversions that can be as little as 1% to 5%. And that is desirable in some cases. Right, because ultimately that means that my material is going to form a solid at relatively low conversions. Okay, that can be good if you're trying to get something that sets up quickly, essentially provides you some mechanical framework to work from. The disadvantage is the shrinkage, right, and the stress that arises because of that low gelation as well. Tons of applications. So this is probably um, in addition to the epoxy amine thermosets. This is far and away the, the second most common type of thermoset that you're going to form and that you're going to use. And so composite applications, uh, additive manufacturing, the vast majority of additive manufacturing uh, in polymers and in photolithography in particular are from this type of reaction forming typically multi-acrylate or in some cases a multi-epoxy uh, cured cationically. Um, structural materials, optics. So because you can make very clear materials um, of controlled shape and controlled refractive index, a lot of optics applications, uh, coatings, hydrogels, biomaterials in a variety of capacities, uh, and others. Okay. Issue is that you have a lot less control, right? So if we wanted to leave 5% um, alkynes in those networks, it was really easy, right, in a step growth network. You just add 5% excess alkyne to the original polymerization. Well, now if I want to leave 5%, say, acrylates in my material, I have to figure out when I reach 95% conversion and stop it there, right? In the case of the step growth, the key feature is that it was self-limiting based on stoichiometry. If we want to control that in any kind of chain growth polymerization, 
We, we don't have that capacity. We can't just use stoichiometry. There's no inherent self-limitations uh, that are trivial to, to apply to that, right? Then you also have this very complex interplay between mass transfer and kinetics. And I use the optical fiber coating as an example. So optical fibers, right, are coated with two coatings. There's a primary coating and a secondary coating. The secondary coating is a glassy acrylate uh, that's applied to the outside of the fiber, essentially to protect it, okay? You oftentimes have one-tenth to two-tenths of a second of light exposure. You have maybe total polymerization time of half a second to a second, right? Because you're starting at the top with literally a glass bolus, and you're ending up at the bottom with an optical fiber that's got these two coatings on it from your tower. So it's an incredibly fast process. And now you think about what's going on in those few tenths of a second. The coating that's applied on there is relatively low viscosity, probably not single centipoise, but tens to hundreds of centipoise, okay? So very, very mobile molecules in that system at that point, right before the light's turned on. Half a second later, you've changed diffusivities by seven to 10 orders of magnitude, okay? The polymerization kinetics are all intimately coupled, as I'll show in a minute, to those diffusivities and those mobilities, right? How fast can a radical move? How fast can a monomer get to a radical to propagate? How fast can two radicals come together to terminate? So all of a sudden, that system becomes incredibly complex with the interplay between uh, mass transfer and the kinetics that occur. And that causes spatial gradients in the material, causes all sorts of uh, complexities to arise. All right. You do also get very brittle materials, typically, because of the high cross-linking densities. Um, residual unreacted functional groups exist. Um, this is when I can scare you a little bit more about dental materials. Typically, when you walk out of the dentist's office, any guess what the conversion is of the methacrylates that they put in that resin? What is very low? I heard very low, but what? It's about 60%, okay? So, okay, that doesn't sound so bad until you figure out those are dimethacrylates. So 60% means if I have, okay, 40% methacrylate unreacted, 0.4 on each end, that means 16% of the monomer is still extractable, okay? Um, and that's not uncommon in many of these applications where you're getting to high glass transition temperature uh, types of materials. And so all of a sudden you've got to deal with that and the fate of those, it can cause uh, yellowing, it can cause toxicity, a variety of other things that happen. Um, and then we get these very highly heterogeneous structures with very broad glass transition temperatures. And the reason that we get those broad glass transition temperatures is that we form a heterogeneous polymer. And so we start out at very low conversions. You know, maybe a, a radical was formed here and a radical was formed here and one was formed here. But on this kind of size scale of tens to hundreds of nanometers, Things aren't uniform. And in these regions, those radicals propagated and essentially formed an intramolecularly cross-linked material that we refer to as these microgels, right? And those microgels basically persist through the polymerization. And as you go on, you get macroscopic gelation where the, the weight average molecular weight diverges. We know that happens at very low conversions. And then ultimately, at the end of the polymerization, those microgels all grow together, but you actually have pools of unreacted monomer that still exist. And in fact, if you take a material like this, a classic dimethacrylate material or a diacrylate material, and you measure its glass transition temperature with mechanics, the width of that tan delta peak can be 150 to 200 degrees C broad. And in contrast, if you do that for an epoxy amine of similar glass transition temperature, you'll find a peak that's only 20 or 30 degrees broad, okay? So a very heterogeneous material in terms of the relaxation times of the chains that exist uh, in that material. So we talked a little bit about this already. Basically, this auto acceleration and auto deceleration, I'll show one slide here in a moment uh, to wrap up that has some of that. But essentially what's going on in this system, right, is the conversion as I continue to react more and more I continue to lower the mobility. As I change the mobility, propagation, termination, chain transfer, even initiation are all mass transfer limited in these polymerizations.
because of that high glass transition temperature, low mobility environment, and because of the, the rate at which the, the uh, kinetics wants to proceed, we almost always find that mobility is limiting or dictating the kinetics in these systems. And that makes for a heterogeneous system and one that's uh, ultimately problematic. And so if you look at that rate versus conversion, and this is for a classic uh, methacrylate system, dimethacrylate, you find auto acceleration. So the rate increases even though you're consuming the methacrylate double bonds, right? So if we were to write classic kinetic expressions for this, we'd write that the rate was proportional to the double bond concentration. So you would think classically that the rate would decrease as the double bond concentration decreased. But instead, because termination is diffusion limited, because you keep building up more and more radicals, you actually find that the rate increases as you increase conversion. Then at some point, you hit a point where propagation actually becomes diffusion limited. And at the point you, your propagation reaction becomes diffusion limited, you hit a, a region called auto deceleration, and your polymerization rate now slows down because ultimately you can't get the double bond to the radical fast as fast. And so the slower and slower that radical or double bond gets to the radical, the slower and slower the polymerization proceeds. And that ultimately, again, we end up with a conversion that's much less than 100%. So with that, I will stop and I'll reserve most of my other things for tomorrow. We'll review types of dynamic chemistries at the start of tomorrow's lecture and then their implementation in networks and the effects that that has uh, after that. What questions do you have? Yeah, please. So gelation causes more shrinkage stress to occur. Gelation won't help with shrinkage. Gelation helps with things like, say I'm doing an additive manufacturing process, right? And I actually want my part to have mechanical integrity at a relatively low conversion. If I have a step growth polymerization with a very high gel point conversion, then I'm going to have to exceed that gel point conversion before my part has mechanical integrity that allows it to essentially stay in that same shape. Whereas if I have a low gel point conversion, that shape becomes permanent much more, much earlier in the polymerization reaction. Anyone else? All right, fantastic. We'll see you tomorrow.